These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The story of Hammurabi continues this week as we reach what is perhaps the most well-documented decade in the entire Bronze Age. Some of this is the coincidence of having three pretty big figures unifying and building at about the same time, but the largest share of the credit goes to the documents of Mari. Almost certainly, every kingdom kept a repository of official correspondence and records, but the city of Mari is, in 1776, when we pick our tale back up, about 12 years away from being completely destroyed and burned to the ground. This would normally be a catastrophe, and indeed it was probably pretty unpleasant for the residents, but those same fires had the fortunate side effect of baking and burying some 20,000 official records and letters from this period, preserving forever the words of the greatest and smallest men of the era, which is why I will be able to quote directly from the mouths of some of these people during this part of the story. And so, we know even though we ended with Babylon and Eshnunna allied in an assault on Shamsiadad's territory, in conjunction with Yamhad and some minor tribal powers, there were also letters that were sent between the two sons of Shamsiadad, from Ishmidagan, the diligent son in Assyria, to his less talented brother, Yasma Adad in Mari, that reads like this. The ruler of Eshnunna has mobilized all his troops, including palace dependents and free men. Camped at Upi, he multiplies the letters he sends to the ruler of Babylon, asking him to join forces and take the city of Mancusum. The Babylonian does not agree. This is going to be a constant feature of Hammurabi's diplomacy, refusing to assist his allies when he judges that it would strengthen them too much or require too much expense for himself. He and Shamsiadad can be as close as a single finger one day, then at war the next day, and friends again the following day, and the two seem to have had a pretty constant diplomatic intercourse throughout this period. Hammurabi sometimes asked to have Babylonian citizens who fled north to be repatriated to face justice in Babylonian courts, perhaps the oldest surviving extradition requests in history, though the tone of the letters suggests that the practice was well known before this time. Hammurabi even asked for Shamsiadad to copy and send him certain literary tablets in something of a royal interlibrary loan. And even when everyone in the world was at war with Shamsiadad, Hammurabi still agreed to help him in little matters, such as when a trade delegation from distant Dilmun, possibly the modern island of Bahrain, came under threat as Yamhad closed in on Mari, and Hammurabi received a request to take them in until it was safe for them to return to the upper Mesopotamian kingdom to complete their trade mission. Of course, we know from our episode on Shamsiadad that circumstances would never at this point improve for the kingdom, and it's unclear what eventually became of the traitors. Which brings us to the summer of 1775, when Shamsiadad, the great conqueror of the north, passes away, leaving the throne to his older son Ishmidagan. Ishmidagan immediately loses Mari to Yamhad, who installs a fellow named Zimri Lim onto the throne, a young son of the dynasty who had ruled the city before Shamsiadad had conquered it. Ishmidagan then loses a large number of his independent tribal supporters, who had been personally loyal to Shamsiadad and did not seem the same charisma in his son. Much of the eastern mountain regions that Ishmidagan had spent his time as prince subjugating revolted, and in the middle of the crisis he was unable to reclaim the lands. And so, in less than a year, the kingdom of Upper Mesopotamia had dissolved. Ishmidagan had lost a father and a brother and two-thirds of the empire, being left with pretty much nothing but the region of Assyria. This is the occasion for possibly the most famous comment from the archives of Mari in which Zimri Lim surveys the situation and states, No king is truly powerful on his own. Ten to fifteen kings follow Hammurabi of Babylon, Rimsin of Larsa, Ibalpiel of Eshnunna, or Amatpiel of Katna, and twenty kings follow Yarim Lim of Yamhad. 
kings here being a reference to the fact that even now, the city-state as the fundamental political entity remained powerful in the imaginations of the great leaders of the age. And each great player had about the same number of cities and Amorite tribes large enough to be led by kings following them as vassals. Zimri Lim doesn't mention his own state, Mari, or his rival Ishmi Dagon in Assyria in this assessment, but they would be a short step below the rest of the kingdoms at this point. Many historians skip over this period of Hammurabi's history almost completely, since the most direct evidence shows him essentially sitting at home and not really bothering anyone. For sure, Hammurabi's own year names record nothing but construction and religious projects for these years, but outside this, he was clearly very active diplomatically. With the power vacuum following Shamsi Adad's death in the north, tribal groups across Mesopotamia began to attack, and we see numerous small accounts of battles numbering in the hundreds of participants against independent towns, Hurrian raiders, and Amorite tribes. The big action in the years immediately following are among the two big winners of Shamsi Adad's death, Mari and Eshnuna. Eshnuna wanted to go in for the kill and begins to campaign northwards into Assyrian territory, pressing hard on Ishmi Dagon. Hammurabi sees this and, to prevent his northeastern neighbor from growing too strong, sends five generals with a total of 6,000 fighting men, a sizable force for the time, as reinforcements to hold off the assault. Seeing this, the king of Eshnunna sends a letter to Zimri Lim requesting that he join in an alliance, which leaves the east and west powers of Mari and Eshnunna allied against the north and south powers of Babylon and Assyria with armies that could have easily reached 15 to 20,000 men on each side. The fighting would have been intense, though nothing is known of the campaigns itself. As the dust settles, however, the last of Assyria's armies are routed. Eshnunna occupies the city of Asher, and Ishmi Dagon, like his father before him, flees to the safety of his ally in Babylon. Eshnunna is territorially the big winner of this war, and sends a letter to Zimri Lim proposing a formal treaty to mark the border between their now neighboring states. Zimri Lim does not respond, and one can only assume that the proposed treaty was viewed as unfavorable to the western state. It's no issue right away, and Mari and Eshnunna both spend the next few years consolidating, while Babylon returns to its construction projects. But Eshnunna, now perhaps the largest power in the region, decided that now was its best shot at attaining Mesopotamian hegemony, the ultimate goal of every state in this period. At the beginning of campaign season in 1772, Eshnunna marches across from the Tigris to the Euphrates River into Babylonian-held Rapicum, and from there his men marched north, conquering every city up the Euphrates, getting most of the way to Mari stopping only to send parts of his army home for the winter farming duties. With the coming of winter, Zimri Lim's increasingly desperate letters and the growing threat of Eshnunna convince Hammurabi to join with Mari, sending troops to garrison the capital itself. In the desert to the north, however, the chief of a village called Andurig defects to the Eshnunans, opening up a second front in the war. This northern tribe, as a side note, are a group of Semitic Amorites called Benjaminites, and despite some research, it's unclear whether or not they're related to the later Israelite tribe of the same name. Zimri Lim was able to take Andarig back, but only by moving troops that were garrisoning an unruly region. The Beni Yamina tribe revolted once the troops were clear, and the Mariot troops had to be recalled from their new conquest to put it down, leaving Andarig as de facto independent. With the northern desert, a region that had been held by Shamsi Adad's empire and was still in a power vacuum no longer being fought over, the influential king of Kurda decided to throw in his lot with Babylon and allied with Hammurabi for protection from Eshnunan encroachment. Babylon, meanwhile, was having some diplomatic difficulty with the beleaguered Zimri Lim, constantly bothering the Mariot king with what seemed like fairly minor points about some border towns. And seeing the general crisis in Mari, the five generals made a polite request to Zimri Lim if they could maybe go home now. 
out of options and putting out fires all around his kingdom, Zimri Lim let them sail back down the Euphrates to Babylon. So much for Hammurabi's support in this war. People tend not to give Zimri Lim very much credit, since he begins his career as a puppet of Yamhad in the West, and after the conclusion of this war, offers quite a lot of land and formal submission to the king of Eshnunna. But the fact that by 1770, he was able to put up enough resistance to retain about half his kingdom and force Eshnunna into a peace at all is definitely a point in his favor. Still, it's not a great outcome for Mari, and they're still fighting diplomatically about the southern border towns, including Hit, the spot favored by the gods for water trials described last episode. Zimri Lim finally gets sick of it, and threatens to invite the Elamites over to help mediate, at which point Hammurabi goes silent on the issue. Now, the Elamites haven't shown up in our narrative since the fall of the Ur dynasty over 200 years ago. Honestly, our knowledge of what they were doing for the last 200 years is pretty poor, but we can guess that they were relatively weak in this interbreeding period. They showed up again in force around 1815, or some 30 years prior to Zimri Lim's threat, seemingly out of nowhere, with enough strength to conquer Larsa, and since then they've been sitting as a powerful threat looming over the fractured kingdoms of Mesopotamia. The next few years see very low-level fighting undergirding furious diplomatic exchanges, and we find that when the contest is primarily on the diplomatic front, no one can match Hammurabi for guile. Promising anything at all and delivering on none of it, Hammurabi manages to secure Rapikam and Hit from Eshnunna and Mari, and the North Syrian Amorites of Kurda, under their new king, who is coincidentally also named Hammurabi, bring themselves even deeper into Babylonian influence, with the specific goal of being able to conquer a chunk of Mari when the Babylonians attack from the south, a war that was widely expected to begin any day now. But Zimri Lim, under intense pressure from all sides, and seeing himself as the obvious next target, decided to widen the playing field. Elam is already somewhat upset with Eshnunna, since they sat on a major pass in and out of the Zagros Mountains, restricting their trade flows particularly with Mari, with whom they traded valuable tin in exchange for the wealth of Phoenicia that flowed through Mari. And so the natural alliance of mutual interests is formed, and Zimri Lim begins to send letters to the king of the now unified Elamites, and in 1767 they appeared from out of the Zagros Mountains. The campaign moved rapidly through Ishnunan territory, and while we don't know if they were caught by surprise or not, we know that in short order the Elamite army, reinforced with elements from Mari and opportunistic Babylon, was at the gates of the capital of Eshnunna itself. Specifics of battles and campaigns are almost never recorded, and we know nothing for certain about the siege of Eshnunna except the outcome. However, this is also the first moment in history when we have enough scattered evidence to really paint a solid picture of what a Middle Bronze Age siege would have looked like. And so we're going to use the occasion of the Siege of Eshnunna to look at a generic large-scale siege battle, reconstructed from fragments of many other siege descriptions in this period. First thing to note is that siege battles were far more common than open field pitched battles. The risk was high, and we've seen many wars won and kingdoms destroyed in a single battle. It was far safer to raid or hide behind the walls of fortresses. Even small towns of a few hundred could be walled, and we have records of those walls holding with as few as a dozen men, though against rather small attacking armies, outnumbering them by only a few times. We've been hearing throughout this show about years in which rulers celebrate improvements to their town walls, but these are likely years marking substantial upgrades, since being made of mud brick like all Mesopotamian architecture, the town walls required maintenance on an annual basis. Of course, that doesn't mean the walls actually received annual maintenance, and when a threat materialized after a period of peace, there would be a mad scramble to get as much repair done as possible before the enemy arrived. 
Once it was known that an enemy was on the march, which in the case of Eshnunna's siege would likely have been as soon as they crossed the main pass from the Iranian mountains, if not earlier, the hard work for the defenders would begin. Even a well-maintained wall would need improvements, and moats around larger cities could be filled with water. Scouting parties would be sent in all directions, often as far as 50 kilometers, to look for the enemy, and at the same time, civilian farmers and pastoralists in the city's influence range would be brought into the protective walls of the city, with whatever animals and grain they could carry, the rest being left in the fields for the enemy to burn or plunder. The people entering the city were acutely aware of what was going to happen to their land, and while at first they would be grateful for the protection of their city walls, when the enemy started to pillage the surrounding countryside, they would quickly begin to despair and agitate the people around them, which was often noted as a problem for morale among the trapped civilians. When one of the roving patrols, which walked day and night, spotted the enemy, it would send up a fire signal, which would be relayed to the other patrols with their own fire signals until it was visible from the city. This let the commanders know which direction the enemy was coming from and move the siege into the first phase. The best outcome for an attacker was to slip through these patrols, easy enough if it's a smaller town with fewer patrols out, and be upon the city before it has time to react, or possibly even shut its gates. And there were reports of towns being taken in a single day. More likely, however, in the case of larger cities and larger attacking armies, it would be difficult to take a city completely unaware. In this case, a besieging force would establish its camp, send out patrols along the perimeter of the city to block anyone from entering or exiting, and begin to settle in. In the first day or so, a messenger would be sent from the attackers demanding the surrender of the city, giving the defenders their first conundrum. You see, it has by now become standard practice for attackers to promise reduced pillaging on cities which surrender quickly, and as the siege goes on, additional messengers would be sent to again request the city's surrender. With each messenger that is refused, the attacker will promise more severe retributions should the city be conquered. And so, this first surrender demand, to submit and be let off with little or no damage, or to resist and risk plundering, was in many ways the most critical. Many cities, having spent the first day or two looking at the attacking army and comparing their own forces, would surrender at this point without a fight. Another option for the defenders was to sally out and have a battle out in the front of the city. This can sound like madness. Why would you give up the safety of your walls for a much more risky open battle? But there were many sound reasons for doing so. One example from the early dynastic period, when sallying appears to have been much more common, is the possibly somewhat historical tale of Gilgamesh of Ur and Aga of Kish, where Ur comes under siege not because King Gilgamesh is on the back foot, but because the Kishites have surprised Uruk and shown up at the gates far sooner than expected. Of course, in the mythic tale, which was recounted back in the episode Gilgamesh Has Adventures, Gilgamesh is described as more or less personally wiping out the Kishai army. But if we assume that Uruk was confident in the number and skill of its soldiers compared to the Kishite force, then it makes sense to march out. After all, a protracted siege would be an unnecessary expense when you're confident that the enemy doesn't actually outnumber you by too much. But a sortie need not be an all-or-nothing matter. The besieging army could not be concentrated all in one spot, or it wouldn't be able to encircle the city. And if its troops are spread out, then it creates an opportunity for the defender to create a local concentration of force and achieve limited strategic objectives before pulling back. Maybe capturing enemy supplies, destroying enemy constructions, or even just reducing the number of enemies and reducing their morale. The kings of the era were very fond of ordering their commanders to be relentless in such active defenses, though of course these would be one more thing to exhaust men that were already growing exhausted. If the city hadn't surrendered or been taken by surprise, or face the enemy in straight combat, then the siege proper can begin. The first thing the attackers would do is construct a fortified camp outside the city to dig in for the long haul.
Sieges of the Middle Bronze Age could be a matter of weeks or months, but rarely would they last for years. Still, a few weeks under siege would be a stressful time, and a few months, depending on how many supplies were stored in advance, could well bring the populace to starvation. Every day, even a day without an assault, was exhausting. For the soldiers on the walls, it is the ultimate boredom of having to stand watch with restricted sleep in full gear, yet always having to be constantly at attention. There were well-known stories of just a few soldiers getting distracted or sleepy and allowing the enemy to get all the way to a section of the wall unchallenged, thus losing the city. Within the town, rations of grain would be handed out, but in small amounts to allow the city to last as long as possible. The civilians may not be standing watch all day, but many of them would be just as sleepless from worry and exhausted from navigating through the overcrowded city each day. And this fear could well be stoked by agents of the enemy, sent into the town in advance before the gates were closed, with the specific goal of inciting unrest in the town, or, as food ran out, the people were fully capable of revolting on their own initiative deciding that surrender is to be preferred over starvation. I don't know of any siege in this period that would get as bad as some of the Chinese or European medieval sieges in which people are reduced to cannibalism, since the Mesopotamians seem to have generally given up well before that point, either the city deciding it had suffered enough, or the invading army deciding that it didn't have enough men to complete their assault. The aforementioned agents, by the way, were very common in this period, and probably for centuries before. Hammurabi and Zimri Lim of Mari both are well known to have sent spies absolutely everywhere, both for information gathering and for sabotage. A disloyal man within a settlement could, as mentioned, cause panic or despair. He could inspect the troops and walls and indicate to the attackers where weak spots might be. He could set fire to food stores, or in some cases, even get a gate open. The value of a sneak attack was well known by everyone, and no competent commander seems to have passed up the chance to get an easy win through trickery. The other side of this coin, then, is constant, tireless vigilance from the defenders, which was demanded universally throughout military life. Discipline for laxity, distraction, or allowing your exhaustion to catch up with you was harsh, as it has been in many militaries throughout history. As the siege wears on, the attackers will continue to send surrender demands and small assaults to test the walls and exhaust the defenders. The defenders, in turn, will continue to watch and starve and maybe make small assaults and also send letters to anyone who will listen. It seems that the siege army's blockades were only partially effective, preventing large flows of people and goods, but allowing letters and messengers in and out with some regularity. Kings could get almost daily reports and reply just as often with orders and independent powers under siege would send out letters to anyone and everyone who might offer reinforcements. Which is another reason why assaulting armies tended not to sit and wait to starve out the enemy, since another army appearing on the horizon to attack the attackers was a constant risk. And so, for the attackers, nearly every day was moving forward towards being ready for the big assault that would be the climax of any siege that didn't end in surrender. In general, an attacking commander was spoiled for choice on how to breach the walls, possessing pretty much all the same techniques of siegecraft as commanders in the late Middle Ages, with the notable exception of projectile launchers like catapults and cannon. They knew of and employed rams, ladders, towers, ramps, spies, and undermining. And so the efforts of the sieging army would typically be divided in three ways, with one group constructing or preparing the assault engines, another group pillaging the countryside for food to keep them all fed, and another group maintaining the blockade of the city. However, all this could be accomplished with surprisingly few people, and there are records of smaller towns being taken by as few as 500 men. It should be reiterated just how small many of these battles were, with defending forces in various battles cited as low as 20 men, 50 in another, 100 in another city, and 300 in yet another letter.
It's speculated, though not certain, that these represent the professional garrison troops, which may have been supplemented by a town's militia. On the attacking side, numbers from 500 to 2,000 are common for average-sized settlements, with only larger cities needing as many as 4,000 men or more. Of course, the siege of Eshnunna would have been massive, easily a few thousand defenders facing 10,000 or more attackers, but this was about as big as armies could get. After the siege camp is set up, and the oracles are taken, though more on the oracles in later episode, the commander will make the decision for how to attack the city, though sometimes the decision will be made for him based on terrain and what sort of supplies he brings with him. The simplest are ladders, simple constructions of wood and reed lashed together. Ladders could be constructed by the smallest armies or transported by boats in large quantities. Simple, portable, and easy to use, ladders seem to have been at least somewhat involved in nearly every assault, whether as a side dish or the main course. However, while smaller settlements naturally tended to have smaller walls, larger cities could easily build walls too high for any normal ladder. And of course, a simple ladder being carried by a group of men offers no protection from incoming arrows, javelins, and rocks, and was risky on its own. For the larger cities, scaling walls required siege towers. These don't seem to have had all the sophistication of later classical era and medieval era towers, which would literally be towers of wood on wheels, but were instead reinforced ladders with a front and side walls of woven reed and maybe a small roof. We don't actually know for certain what they looked like, since no art or examples have survived to this day, but they are well attested in writing, and we even have a fascinating mathematical exercise in which a scribal student was asked to perform the math to figure out how big a siege ramp, tower, and ladders should be for a 22 meter high wall. Siege towers seem to have capped out at around 5 to 6 meters, which may be taller than unsupported ladders, but was still only sufficient by itself for a medium-sized settlement. For the largest cities, the most common, and to my mind the most frightening, of assault methods is the siege ramp. Literally, the attackers would begin a distance away from the wall, building a mound of dirt which would slowly, slowly rise and approach the wall as an earthen ramp. This was the slowest and most labor-intensive of methods, but if successfully completed, it could completely negate the wall and the defender's advantage. So terrifying was the inevitable doom that a ramp represented that many cities would surrender while it was only half finished, their resistance broken just from seeing the enemy's determination. But of course, just because it was effective doesn't mean it was easy. Soldiers and civilian laborers worked on all siege construction projects in tandem, but with a ramp even more laborers would be required, and more soldiers would need to be detailed to stand with their shields to guard the workers, since even at the start of the project they would be constantly pelted by increasingly desperate defenders. A ramp under construction was also a prime target for sorties and nighttime raids. On the largest walls, like in the city of Eshnunna, capital of a sizable kingdom, ramps, towers, and ladders would be used in conjunction, such as in the aforementioned math homework. In this document, we can get a glimpse at both the applied mathematics of the Mesopotamians, as well as an idea for some of the scale involved in the largest sieges. The problem given to the student is to fill in all the details for constructing a ramp to assault a 22 meter high wall. Now stop and think about how big that is. Approximately a five story modern building, 10 or 20 feet thick, encircling the entire city made of nothing but mud brick built by hand all the way from digging it out of the muck to hauling it in place to assembly big enough for multiple men to walk along the ramparts and crenellated at the top to defend from incoming fire. These walls were seriously impressive, and so it took serious engineering to go over the top of them. 
In the math problem, the ramp reaches maximum height at only 18 meters, or four short from the top of the wall, and gets that high at 48 meters away from the wall, meaning that there's still half a football field of length to fill in as a flat run. Then wooden planks would be laid down and the siege towers wheeled up to cover the remaining four meters. Why not just build the ramp all the way to the level of the wall, you might ask? And the answer is, we aren't completely sure why not, though certainly it could be to discourage the enemy from making a counter charge on your own ramp while it's nearly completed. Anyway, the math problem continues on to find the volume of dirt needed for this massive ramp construction. 18 meters high, a good 240 meters long in total, and 36 meters wide. My own quick math, using a calculator of course, I'm not an ancient Sumerian scribe, tells me that this is just short of 100,000 cubic meters of dirt. That's about the same volume as a small modern container ship. Imagine filling one of those by hand with nothing but a copper shovel, while other people are shooting at you non-stop. Now imagine being part of a crew of 10,000, completing this in only five days. That's the ultimate solution to the labor input needed section of the math homework, though of course realities on the ground would add to that. Still, a ramp assault lasting only seven days was reported by Ishmi Dagan to his father Shamsi Adad in a similar circumstance, and generally speaking, even the largest of ramps managed to get finished in two or three weeks. For armies that didn't have the labor to build a full ramp or didn't want to risk climbing ladders, battering rams were common enough in large kingdoms. I say in large kingdoms because a ramp is a giant piece of wood, the core of a massive tree, possibly with a copper or bronze shell on the front for durability. Many independent kings simply wouldn't have access to large pieces of wood due to the lack of forests in the region, and even large kingdoms would have to bring their few rams with them to siege if they ever wanted to use it. It wasn't something that could just be assembled on site like the other options. However, a ram under a mobile housing, or even just protected by shield bearers, could pound on the typically wooden gates, or could be rolled up a ramp to collapse a wall segment and allow the attackers to advance the rest of the way up a hill of rubble rather than ladders. Still, even though the gates of a great city would be made of wood, that doesn't mean they would be knocked down easily. Often reaching six meters high, these barriers would be made of thick cedar imported at great expense from modern-day Lebanon and would be a huge point of civic pride, typically dedicated to the city's patron deity. If you will recall, back in the Epic of Gilgamesh, some thousand years previously, the big prize from Gilgamesh's defeat of the Humbaba monster was a massive cedar door to install onto a temple. Indeed, it's possible that these doors would have been seen as such a prize that a defender would prefer to capture it intact rather than knocking it down in some instances. The last option, undermining, was used when siege engines couldn't be constructed for whatever reason. One option that was apparently known about, though rarely used, was to dig a hole in the ground just outside of the enemy's arrow range, then tunnel underneath the earth until reaching the walls, at which point you could collapse the tunnel and bring down a section of the wall. This was safe, but slow and laborious, and the local geology would only sometimes cooperate, especially when the water table was very high. More common was to simply dig into the wall itself. I was just telling you about how amazing and impressive these walls were, but ultimately they were all made of mud brick. Copper tools can dig through mud brick, either making a tunnel or collapsing a whole wall segment, and it's a job that literally anyone can do. It requires none of the scarce and expensive wood of other engines and takes fewer people than a massive ramp. The downsides of this, however, are pretty obvious when you consider that the defenders are generally uninterested in letting attackers get to the wall unmolested, and it seems to have been a less favored tactic. If the defenders haven't been able to dislodge the attackers from their camp, haven't been able to stop the siege construction, and haven't received reinforcements, then this brings us to the climax of the siege. 
the actual battle would have been a bloody slaughter. The defense of the walls would have been highly dependent on the defender's morale, battered by sleeplessness and hunger. A letter from the city of Shenna reports that the city commander, quote, said to the herald, get the troops up to the wall to defend against the coming assault. But one of the officers, Ushatashni El, rose and said, my troopers will not go on the wall. The herald said, my commander sent me with these orders, and Ushatashni El acted maliciously and shoved the herald. Outright mutiny was far from uncommon when the decisive hour approached, and recall that it was in exactly this sort of situation that Sargon of Akkad, the son of a gardener, led a revolt in besieged Kish, murdering the old king and cooperating with the besiegers to surrender the city as he took the throne for himself. On the other hand, there were also men who went to the last with total dedication to their king, their city, and their god. Should the attackers be repulsed on the walls, they would typically try a few more times before giving up. But once the wall was taken or breached, it was over for the city. I know of no reports in which the attackers made it into the city itself, but then failed to finish the job, even in cities with secondary walls or inner citadels, though those might take another round of assaults to conquer. A city that let the matter go all the way to a full-on assault was in for a bad time, as I've discussed in previous episodes. An accepted part of the military compensation package is the right to plunder a flesh conquest for wealth and slaves, and a certain amount of destruction, rape, and murder would follow, sometimes lasting for days. It was a little more complicated than just taking anything you could carry, since plunder would be collected and divided up among the king and commanders, but for your average soldier, your reward for all the toil of the siege was pretty much anything you could take with your own two hands for the rest of the day. The conquest of Eshnunna by the Elamites, aided by Mari and Babylon, was a shock to the world order. Only ten years after Shamsiadad had risen and fallen, now another city had made its attempt at the Mesopotamian Empire and collapsed under the strain. But in a way, this was even bigger than the end of Shamsiadad's empire because it left the Elamites, already the most powerful kingdom in the region, in an absolutely dominant position. And so it will be his performance in the ensuing Great War of 1765 that ensures Hammurabi's place in the annals of history. So join us next time for the tale of the turning point of Hammurabi's life and the most thrilling and well-documented war of the Bronze Age. Thank you for listening.